Hello and welcome to you all as we gather once again for worship. Uh, we do so by video again this week. I pray that from wherever you watch this, um, uh, from your homes or uh, wherever this uh, video comes to you, that the Lord blesses you. And whether you are a member of the Hope CRC congregation from our community or if you are viewing this in, uh, from some other place, we hope that in this time uh, that ultimately God's name is lifted up and praised, but too, through the songs we sing, uh, through the words that we hear, through the prayers that we offer, that his name is lifted up, that we are edified and encouraged, and that we can be assured of God's faithfulness. Uh, just a message to the Hope CRC congregation. Once again, we want to give thanks for your prayers and words of support that I've received as well as others in this, uh, these past few days and weeks. Uh, your prayers and support are continue to be coveted and we're thankful for that. Um, also just want to make uh, the congregation aware of that uh, the council will be continuing to monitor any declarations by health agencies as well as our, our state and federal governments as far as advice for when we can gather again. Uh, know that we will be taking those things into consideration and any change in news or plans that we will uh, certainly make it a priority to communicate that with you as soon as possible. In the meantime, we encourage you to continue to uh, reach out to each other in the ways that are, are, are safe and, and reasonable. Um, People in hearts and hands group, uh, maybe continue to make phone calls to each other, uh, make phone calls to, uh, to friends, and, uh, and in other ways, show hospitality. And not only to ourselves, but think of others within uh, your neighborhood, within the community that could use a word of encouragement or help. May we continue to be the hands and feet of Christ as we continue in this time. As we join together uh, today, uh, I'd like to open with the words of the psalmist. Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. And when I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord, I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. And I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord. In your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. As we remember those promises and we make our promises to God. Let us receive our Lord's greeting. People of God, grace to you and peace. In the name of God the Father Almighty, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the work of his Holy Spirit. And from wherever we view this today, may all of God's people say, Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this day that you give to us. I pray, Lord, that you will bless us as we worship today. Lord, we pray that you will hear our prayers. That the songs we sing will stir us to praise. And Lord, that you will receive them as Lord is our humble worship. May your word to us challenge us, encourage us, lead us. And Lord, may we be sent out 
with the affirmation and with the continued reminder that we are to be your people. That we are to be salt and light. A city on a hill. A light that is not covered. That we are to be witnesses of your kingdom. We are able to pray these things because of Jesus Christ. Whose death and resurrection sets us free. In his name we pray. Amen. So I invite you from your homes, wherever you gather, uh, to sing with us the hymn, We Praise You, O God. In our Christian walk, we know that we are, continue, we are called to continue in faithfulness to him. And we recognize if we are honest with ourselves, with others, and with God, that we have fallen short of how God wants us to live. Throughout God's word, we are given encouragement for how we are to live. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, throughout God's word from Genesis to Revelation, uh, Today, our call to confession and our challenge uh, for holy living is found from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
we are reminded that we are to seek after the faithfulness of God. As we remember that, let's spend just a moment in prayer. Lord God, we recognize that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And Lord, as we have read from 1 Peter, we know often, Lord, the way that we have used our tongues, the things that we've done, have not shown the gentleness, the kindness that you call us to live, uh, the long-suffering, even in spite of difficulty, and even the criticism of others. I ask, Lord, that we might remember where we find our true peace and freedom. It is not given by the earthly authorities. True peace comes when we follow Jesus Christ. Help us to remember uh, that you are our true king. Lord, may we show that faith to others as well. Lead us and guide us. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We believe in God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we usually uh, do during our evening services, but have not done uh, for a time since we haven't been able to meet together, uh, we profess our faith. So today, from wherever you are watching this, Join with me with the words of the Apostles' Creed, professing our faith and saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we remember that profession let us go before our Lord in prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we come before you this day, I pray that you will continue to watch over us. As it's been a little over a month now since we've been able to worship together, we have seen uh, uh, the struggle that our world has experienced uh, with the coronavirus. That there are many, Lord, who are mourning the loss of loved ones, and Lord, while we give thanks that in many ways we have been shielded in this part of uh, the United States, there are many other places, Lord, that are reeling uh, from the effect that this has had on their lives, on their physical health. For those, Lord, who are mourning the loss of loved ones, for those whose hearts are with those who are hospitalized but they cannot visit, we think of those in the healthcare fields, Lord, who uh, are under a lot of stress. For those in emergency services who have to uh, be out and often exposed to those who have been uh, ill. We think of those, Lord, who, whose schedules have been changed and whose routines, Lord, have been greatly altered. We continue to pray for uh, our students for our teachers at all sorts of different levels of education. We think of those, Lord, who are in the service fields, whose work has been greatly altered. Establishments have been closed. Uh, interaction has been limited. And no, Lord, too, uh, we pray for those who have been furloughed, who have been laid off, who have even lost their jobs, and now are dealing with the financial stress of not having a regular income. Lord, we pray, Lord, have mercy. We pray for healing, for strength, for restoration. 
And we pray, Lord, as as a people of God, that uh, we might continue to not only as we care for uh, one another, that we might look to those who are in need and seek to be people of compassion. I ask, Lord, that as we come before you today, we continue to keep those who uh, uh, have been hospitalized, who have been dealing with health issues within our own congregation. We ask that you pray, uh, that you watch over them as we pray for them today. We give thanks to Brad Van Grote. He's is feeling much better after he underwent surgery to uh, relieve an abscess in his abdomen. We pray for him and his continued strength and his recovery. We're thankful that Steve DeYoung was successfully able to have surgery on his shoulder and was able to return home as well. We pray for him and his recovery. We think of many others, Lord, who have been affected in, uh, uh, by uh, the coronavirus, who've been afraid to go out, who are very limited, who are cautious. We pray for those who are older and elderly within our congregation. We ask, Lord, that you will lift them up and care for them. Lord, we ask that you will be with our community, with our state, with our nation. And Lord, that you will watch over this world. We pray for those who are in leadership, for those who have to make decisions about health, for those who govern our country. We pray for President Trump and those who are in positions of leadership, that you will give them wisdom and surround them with other people who give them wise advice. We pray, Lord, for the nations of this world. And Lord, for those nation, the leaders of those nations, that you will give them wisdom as well. Lord, we know that there will only be true peace and true guidance when we seek you together, united, when we bow before your throne. We pray, Lord, for the work of your spirit in ways that we do not yet understand, that, Lord, that you will stir the hearts of those who do not yet believe, that you will call them into faith and to faithful obedience. And Lord, we pray for your people as we call upon your name that we will remain faithful, held by your spirit, and that together we might know that through the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who was offered on the cross as our substitute to pay for sins and to take on a punishment that we deserved, that it is in the name of Jesus we find hope. In his death and resurrection, we give thanks for his gift. May we live our lives in gratitude for it. Now, Lord, too, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, that you will lead us and guide us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we offer this prayer. Amen. I'd like to spend just a couple minutes talking to uh, the kids again. Thank you again for your pictures. And they remind me as they sit here how you would often be sitting here with me. And so I'm going to sit here with you on the steps. So if you can use your imaginations. I have in my hand two things. I have an apple and I have a Bible. Now you might say, what do these have in common? And I'd like to explain it a little bit to you today. We say the apple is food. We eat an apple and it is good for us. And we think of the good food that our moms and dads make for us every day so that we're taken care of and that our bodies can grow strong and healthy. We're even thankful for the good treats that sometimes we get, like candy or ice cream or dessert. Those things we love. We need food to live. Have you ever heard that the Bible is good food too? Now that might seem kind of strange for you to hear. If I open up the Bible, there's no food that falls out. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to take a a bite out of a Bible like we would take a bite out of a sandwich. That wouldn't be any good. But we say the Bible is food not for our stomachs, but for our minds and for our hearts. 
This morning, I'm going to be reading a letter that Paul, who was a missionary for Jesus, wrote to one of his friends. And he encouraged his friend, who was named Timothy, to stay faithful in following God's word. Even sometimes when it was hard. And if he continued to feed his mind and his heart with God's word, that he would be strong enough and he would have what he needed so he could continue to do the work that God called him to do. So what I want to encourage you to do, and maybe you can help your moms and dads as well with this, is to have them read you Bible stories. To have them pray with you and pray for you. Maybe you have a favorite Bible story. Ask your mom and dad to read it for you. Or maybe they can share with you their favorite story or their favorite Bible verse. And when we do that, we are reminded over and over again of what Jesus did for us on the cross, how much he loves us, and how much no matter what happens, God is taking care of us. That's what I want us to remember today. That we take God's word as food that he gives us to us and put it in our hearts. As we remember that, will you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful for the food of your word. And as we read it, may it feed our hearts and minds. Lead us and guide us. Challenge us. Nourish us. And Lord, in all things, may we offer you our worship because we hear the story of how much you have loved us in your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Invite you to open your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Second Timothy 4, verses 1 through 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We give thanks for God's word to us today. How do you want your story to end? When our time on this earth, whether the Lord comes before or when he calls us home, what do we want others to have said or to think about our lives? Now, I want you to think back a few weeks before the coronavirus before Lent and Easter, 
We, as a congregation here at Hope, were reading from the book of Acts and Paul's missionary journeys. Now, the book of Acts contains a lot of information about Paul and the places that he went uh, in his different missionary journeys. But more important for us to know when we read the book of Acts, we read about how Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, was forming and building his church and how the news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, was spreading a call across the world. Now in the last few chapters of the book of Acts, we read of Paul's arrest. We read of threats being made on his life by the Jewish authorities and those who were hostile to his message. As we read in the last few chapters of Acts, we see how he was shuffled from one government official to the next, each one giving them a hearing. And then finally, him being sent to Rome to be tried. And that journey was difficult. On the way to Rome, he was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. He was handed over to the authorities. But as we come to the end of Acts, we read that he was still, even though confined to his home, still able to freely share the gospel. At the end of Acts, we come to the end of what the Bible says about Paul. But we believe that Paul's journeys were not at end, that they still continued. Um, after a two years, as we read at the end of Acts, we believe that uh, from historians and scholars that, that Paul was released and that he made at least one more missionary journey that we don't read about in the Bible. That he visited more churches and some early ch church historians say that Paul even made a journey even farther west to the ends of the earth as one historian accounts. And many believe that Paul made it to what is now modern day Spain. But then he was arrested again. And once again he was brought to Rome. And tradition and history uh, share that Paul was eventually executed. That he was beheaded during the persecution of the emperor Nero. So I wanted to close out um, our series on Acts. Actually by reading from 2 Timothy today. 2 Timothy, we believe, is one of the last letters that Paul wrote before he was executed. Timothy was someone that he mentored. Timothy was a young man. And in his last days, Paul wanted to encourage Timothy as, as he took on more responsibility. And at the center of, of Paul's message that he wanted to give to Timothy... But that we take for ourselves is a reminder to preach the word. Not just preach the word, but to live the word. I asked at the beginning of this message, how do you want your story to be told? How do you want it to end? And it's tied in with some questions that I've asked over the past couple of weeks. Last week I asked... You to think about this question. What are you learning? What is this time of separation and of altered schedules and some of the disappointments with cancellations and, and changes to life? What is it teaching us about our relationship with God? What is it teaching us about our faith? It was a reminder to do some self-evaluation and to be intentional as we thought about who we are in the eyes of God. This week I'd like to ask one more question. On a few occasions when I've had the opportunity to visit with people who were in the later stages of life and knew that that time was coming. I've had the opportunity to ask them. What would you like me to say about you at your funeral? I ask this question because for many, they say they feel helpless when they're dying. They've tried to stop it through treatments, through medication. 
But none of it was to be. The treatment wasn't successful. So asking people what they would like said at their funeral gives people the opportunity to provide some kind of control when they die. Even if we can't stop death itself, we can control our attitudes and how we approach it. When I ask this question, some people appreciate it. But others don't quite know what to say. You see, some people think that I'm asking them to brag about themselves. To put themselves into as good as light as possible. And most people that I know that I've ministered to are uncomfortable with doing that. A lot of people will answer in so many words. They will say, don't make it about me. Tell them instead that they need Jesus. That they need to know the story of Jesus. Tell the gospel story. My grandmother said in her later years, at my funeral, I don't need the minister preaching me into heaven. I appreciated those words, her sentiment, not wanting to brag. The focus needed to be on the good news of the gospel because that in the end is what we needed to hear. Many of us say that we know this. At least we know it's the right thing to say. But it's only when that time comes that we can see our time on earth might be short and it's coming to close that all the things that we held on to so tightly all the things we built, all the treasures that we gathered, they don't really matter. It's our relationship with God that truly endures. We don't have to wait until the end of our lives to realize this. How is it that we can know God? How is it that we can know that we're saved? One of our confessions, the Belgic Confession, gives us uh, some guidance. It says, the means by which we know God. This is article two of the Belgic Confession. It says, we know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe since the universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. God's eternal power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1 verse 20, all these things are enough to convict humans and to leave them without excuse. Second, God makes himself known to us more clearly by his holy and divine word. As much as we need in this life for God's glory and for our salvation. You see, we can see God in nature and in his creation. Uh, those words once again from Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that we are people without excuse. And so that people as a whole are without excuse. We can know more about God when we read his word, even though we can see him in nature. And we focus on his truth as we read it in the gospel. So this morning, remember to focus on the truth. Why did Paul focus on God's word? The main reason is he's, he was, as he was giving advice to Timothy, he gives advice to us. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get sidetracked. We lose our focus. And if we lose that focus on God, 
then our focus begins to turn inwardly onto ourselves. We have to ask ourselves weekly, daily, sometimes hourly, where is our final authority? Unfortunately, we might say with our mouth that our authority comes from God, but we need to check our hearts. Do we believe that? Sometimes our actions betray our words. Chuck DeGroat, in one of his recent books, writes this. He says, people, whether spiritual or not, are often inconsistent and impulsive because their final authority is their gut. While some might claim allegiance to God or to some other source, ultimately the God that they trust is their own omniscient and omnipotent self. Very simply said, we make gods of ourselves. We will include God in our conversations and our decisions just as long as God is on board with our plans. A long time ago, uh, the preacher evangelist D.L. Moody said this, the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps on crawling off the altar. What I see happening more and more in our world is that people make up their minds about certain issues and then only look to the sources of information that support their opinions. As a Christian, I can understand that. Because I understand, we should understand where our primary source of authority is driven from. But that's also a challenge. As Christians, do you know where your starting point of reference should be found? When all is stripped away, what is the one thing, the one truth that we hold on to? Our foundation is faith that what God reveals to us in his word is true. God does have something to say to us about how we use our time. God does have something to say to us about how we use our material wealth. God does have something to say to us about how, he, about how we are supposed to use our, our talents, our gifts. Now, while God does not give detailed instructions about all the minutia of every single piece of life, he does give us a set of principles that guide us in a way that help us make decisions about how we are to live and also how we are to share our lives. I'm asking questions this sermon. And another question that I want to ask you is when is the last time that you have made an important decision that is countercultural? That goes against popular opinion. That does not follow what is generally accepted in this world around us. When is it that you have done something that guides you in a way that didn't give you an audience, that perhaps didn't provide you with the, the approval of others? but you knew was faithful to the one who made you, to the one who saves you. I guarantee you, to all of us, if we are living our faith and submitting to the authority of God, it will bring us into tension, if not outright conflict, with the popular opinion of many. That's why I say focus on the word, Live the word in season, as Paul writes to Timothy, and out of season, when popular or not popular. 
Use that word to correct and rebuke. Guiding yourself and others and letting God pro- provide you through his word the information that you need. The information and the truth that shows you the way of salvation in Jesus Christ. As well as providing you a conscience and a critique to the world around you. However, as Paul guides Timothy, we are not to share the word of God like a hammer looking for a nail. We are to share what God says, as Paul writes, with great patience and careful instruction. One commentary uh, reads, uh, The apostle demands that Timothy shall show his calm and well-balanced attitude in all matters. This means, of course, that also with respect to suffering for the sake of the gospel, Timothy must neither court such suffering on the one hand, nor complain about it on the other. Paul is well aware that many won't give believers in Jesus Christ patience or won't be interested in careful instruction. We are constantly bombarded to seek after the quick solution, the snappy comeback, the hot take in matters that are important. What I read here in this text is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to pursue the long game, the faithful journey, the marathon, not the sprint. Because this is eternity that we're talking about. And because of that, believing in Jesus is not easy. Submitting our lives to Jesus is hard. In a country that prizes freedom and liberty, it is a daily discipline to submit our lives to Christ. In my devotions this week, and I felt it applied as well to the text that we read today, I found this verse compelling from 1 Peter. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. We praise God for the freedoms that we have in this country. And we feel it acutely sometimes when those freedoms are limited. Yet we need to constantly ask ourselves as believers. What are we using that freedom for? We say we thank God for our freedoms. But when with that same mouth. And with our hands, we live like God doesn't matter. We say that we want freedom of speech. We say we want to do what we want. That we should live and choose as as we want to do. But somewhere along the line, we follow the temptation that as we exercise those freedoms, we leave God behind. And instead of being slaves for God, the only people that we end up really serving is ourselves. Remain in faith. Keep running the race of faithful obedience to Jesus. And the reminder to us all is to finish strong. If you're looking at the picture, I chose this picture for a purpose. You know, I could have chosen a race with world-class sprinters, like runners running in the Olympics or some other championship. Instead, the picture that, that you saw shows ordinary people finishing a race and finishing it well. We are ordinary people called to an extraordinary task and we pray by God's grace that we will finish well. We need to continue to keep our eyes on the prize. What is the victory that we want to win? 
As one of the sources from my reading this week reminded me, the book of Acts isn't about Paul. Even the story of Paul isn't about Paul ultimately. It's about how Jesus interrupted the life of a human being and put this person on a different course and direction in order that the church of Jesus Christ would grow and strengthen and spread across this world. When we talk about finishing strong from a biblical perspective, we take a cue from Paul's advice to Timothy We don't hope to finish well so that we can be proud of our accomplishments. We don't look for the final approval to come from our our spouses, our, our children, or our family. Finishing well does not mean that our greatest goal is to be recognized by our peers that we were good and capable at whatever it is that we did in life. Finishing well does not mean that we have this eye-catching large obituary printed in the paper or that people speak publicly about our life's accomplishments. We shouldn't, as I said before, desire that anyone has to preach us into heaven. Paul reminds us that our greatest goal is is to appear before the righteous judge Our only goal and award that we seek is to aspire to be in the presence of Jesus and that by his grace, through faith, that he will award us with the crown of righteousness. Paul is talking about finishing his race. He knew that his time was close, that he was being poured out like a drink offering. In Christ We believe Paul, as well as all who believe in Jesus, finished that race well. In Greek and Roman culture, the winner of a competition would often be awarded a crown made of some kind of greenery like olives or laurels, some other material. Paul is looking to a crown of something of even greater value, a crown of righteousness. The greatest prize of all, eternal life in Jesus Christ. So as we consider what God says to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through the words of Paul. As we consider our own lives in this time, in this place. I understand and we know how hard it is to be patient. We know that the work is hard. Where will we find our foundation? Even in an anxious time, be faithful. Focus on the truth. Finish strong. Find your hope in Jesus Christ and seek his truth and pattern your lives after his word with the hope that rests in Jesus. Run the race. Preach the word. Focus on his truth. And finish strong. Let's pray together. We thank you once again, Lord, for your word, for your hope and promises to us. Keep us focused on your word and your love for us. Help us to be a witness, faithful, however this journey, however long this journey may last. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we remember God's faithfulness, I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this week. And as we conclude our worship service, may we go with the Lord's blessing. People of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his blessing. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And from wherever we see this today, 
May we say together, amen. We'll close out our worship with a singing by faith. Bye.